Hopefully we'll give you guys some good and valuable information today. Uh, we'll be talking about antimicrobials and what some of the new guidelines mean and some of the things that we're doing to try to help educate everybody. And so we'll go ahead and get started. First off, you know, antibiotics, whether you're in the consumer sphere or in the production sphere, it seems to be on everybody's minds lately. And obviously it is a big issue, and it's a very an emotional issue of, is my food safe? Is it safe for my child to eat? What are you doing about it? Why are you using antimicrobials? And so that's first and foremost something that we've got to be aware of as producers, that it's not just a matter of using a product, it's how can we visit and work with our consumers and other people that are not in the industry to ensure them that we're doing the right thing. So all of our antimicrobials are FDA regulated, and it does inv involve looking at food safety, so the pork products that we use, as also as human safety as far as, you know, end stage um, withdrawals and, and any kind of residue levels. You know, even though a lot of times we feel in pork that we're being attacked, it isn't just pork people, that people are looking at. They're also looking at poultry, at beef, any kind of animal that's produced for food, dairy. We all are facing the same issue. And unfortunately right now, it's, we're still all trying to fight this a little bit separately. And so we're really working hard to have the same message across the species, but truthfully it is a little bit divided. We're our own advocates. There's not one universal advocate for production agriculture. And so a lot of times when you have companies or even customers, when they look at antimicrobial issues or the use of gestation stalls, a lot of it is a brand differentiation. And a lot of times we may wish it's not that way, but unfortunately that's how the marketplace plays out and that's where we're at. And so that's also something to be cognizant of as we discuss this issue. So really the core of why we're even talking about this is antimicrobial resistance. Um, obviously it is a global concern. You know, many, many years ago in Denmark they decided to pull all antimicrobials and have everything under a veterinary uh, use. And so there's still antimicrobials out there, but it's very highly regulated. And because of this issue of antimicrobial resistance and having resistance leading to human infections. What I can say is this has gotten on the radar of both veterinary community as well as the human medical community, and we are working on this together from this one health perspective. And if you haven't heard that before, it's basically a, a group that's saying, hey, we are all in this world together. Whether we're humans taking medications for our own illness or consuming food, you know, meats and meat proteins, we all have a, a, some skin in this game as far as resistance goes. And so that's why we need a huge collaborative effort to solve this problem. It's not one group that takes the blame nor the other. And so as producers, we do have, again, a, a responsibility to make sure that we are looking at antimicrobial resistance and how we're using our products to make sure that we're minimizing the potential for this to become a human health hazard. And so it's not a new issue. You know, that's really the start of the PQA program to make sure we didn't have residues in our pork. We may not have said at that time that it was specifically for resistance, but it's because we didn't want to have residues in the food supply that people consume. And so it's something that's an ongoing issue. So what are these changes and what do they mean? Well, right now, just for a quick review, we have four major claims. There's for disease treatment, for disease control, for disease prevention, and so when you look at that category of prevention, basically your treatment and control and prevention, those three are considered as a treatment or therapeutic usage. And those right now are ones that are not being addressed. They're not being subject to the regulations because the government and FDA recognizes the need to have treatment options for animals. However, the last category, which is growth promotion or production efficiency, nutritional efficiency, that is something that has been um, a hot button issue. And this is the area where a lot of these antimicrobial changes are going to hit home. So one of the verbiage that you'll hear is medically important. A lot of these antimicrobials that we look at, if they're medically important, they're going to be subject to a lot of these new regulations and changes. And what this means is FDA has defined it, it's the same class or same antibiotic that's used in both humans and in animals. So for example, tetracyclines. We use those in human medicine, we also use those in animal medicine. So antimicrobials that are used in both categories are considered medically important. 
Obviously, there's some medications that are very animal specific because, for instance, humans don't get coccidia, or if they do, it's a different species and it's not subject to the antimicrobials that we use in livestock production. And so there's several different antimicrobials here. So bacitracin, mechadox, naricin, bamromycin, and tiamulin, all of those are very specific to animals and would not be subject to some of these new regulations because they're not considered medically important. And so that's hopefully is a little bit clear on what's being regulated, what is not. So what are the regulatory actions? Obviously, you know, uh, the Obama administration had listed this as a big priority and wanted to make sure the regulations were being tightened, so FDA really has taken a look at a lot of this and the regulations ensued. And so, really where the rubber hits the road, on January 1, 2017, the new regulations addressing on-farm antibiotic use are going to be in effect. And so that's not, that's not a, it might be in effect or will be in effect, it will be in effect as of Jan 1. And that's why we're talking about it now, because we'll at least have a year to try to get a lot of these questions and concerns addressed and identified before we have the end date. So there's a couple different things. The first one is Guidance 209. That came out, I think it was in 2010. And really what it did is it targeted the removal of the growth promoting claim of medically important antimicrobials in animals. And that's something that's been talked about for quite some time. And so really it's, it's not having that label claim anymore. The other part of that was to really have a lot of the uses of antimicrobials in animals and food production brought under the control of a veterinarian. And so that would limit some of the over-the-counter uses. It would limit some of the other uses that we have had, you know, before this time. The second one, or okay, so I, we mentioned this before, um, all of the antimi antimicrobials that we use other than the ones listed will actually uh, be affected. However, the ones that are not medically important will still be available over the counter. So if you use BMD, for example, that one will be available. Or mechadoxin feed, um, that one will still be available and will not require uh, a VFD or a prescription to use. So there's a little bit of differences in antimicrobials. The next one that happened, we had another guidance from FDA called Guidance 213. And this one requested that animal health companies basically outline their intentions of how they're going to voluntarily roll out the label claims for growth promotants from all the antimicrobials that are, are medically important. And so that really was something that was a big step for FDA to do and not just, you know, say, okay, maybe we're going to do this. It was a clear indication that it will happen. So far, all of the animal health companies have agreed to do so, and so this will be implemented basically Jan 1 of 2017. And that does require some work because when you get feed or feed tickets and antimicrobials, they will have to have those labels on those antimicrobials changed. And so that really goes back on to the drug companies to have to do this. Um, and that may change some of how you handle medications if you have your own feed mill or make your own feed. But again, we have a year's time to try to get this all completed. The other part of this is the veterinary feed directive. And this is one measure of, of getting these antimicrobials back under a veterinary use. We have had several VFD drugs, and I think that was instituted in 1996. And so we had, as veterinarians, had exposure doing that. We've worked with feed mills. we worked with producers. But what's going to happen now is that all antimicrobials that are considered medically important, that human-animal use drug, will now require a VFD for you to use those on the farm. And so that does change the landscape a little bit as far as how we have our time management and cost management, really. So what does this mean, again? Growth promotants, basically any kind of growth promotant at the low level, if it's a medically important drug, so for example, lincomycin at low dose levels will not be available to use at those low dose levels anymore. And I just picked that drug, I'm not saying picking on anybody's company, but as of December 31st in 2016, you will no longer be able to use that medication in that purpose. Um, other feed grades, if they're human use categories, will also not be available anymore over the counter. So you'll eventually see an inventory depletion at a lot of the farm and feed stores until they're gone as of December 31st on 2016. 
This also affects water medication. Before, we were just talking about feeds, and then a lot of veterinary prescriptions, injectables, were, were worked out with a prescription. These new guidance rules change that. So if you're using a medically important antimicrobial in water, that will require a veterinary prescription to use. So again, if you're looking at tetracyclines for a pneumonia, you'll need to have a veterinary prescription in order to use that on your farm. And that is not something that we've had to do before, because before that particular medication, you could have gotten over the counter, use it by the label directions, and been done with it. But that will change. So we do know that some of our antimicrobial availability may decrease. We, we do know that the use in certain uses of some drugs will change. And so what to, it really does mean is that if you want to use things in a growth promotion level, that will now become illegal, basically as of 2017. It's not just a bad thing, it's illegal. Because it won't be on the label, it will not be recognized, and FDA will take enforcement action if that does happen. And that doesn't matter whether you're a really big company or you own one pig. Any of those antimicrobial uses across the board will not be, will not be legal. And we may even see some of the medications you've used in the past no longer be available either, because if they only had one indication for growth promotion or nutritional efficiency, and it's a drug used in humans or animals, that may go away altogether. So it will require additional time and the time to develop a relationship with a veterinarian if you don't have one. And we do realize that there's all different sizes and types of farms, and this may put a hardship. We've expressed this to FDA because some veterinarians in rural areas or in other underserved areas may be utilizing a small animal veterinarian, which is fine but it will require that a pork producer needs to have a relationship with a veterinarian if they want to use these antimicrobials to treat animals. And obviously we know that there's going to be time involved and potentially increased cost, and a lot of this we've also conveyed to FDA, but so far this is what we're going to have to deal with and plan for. Again, our concern is are there going to be enough veterinarians? We don't know. You know, we hope over time, even if we have areas that are underserved, we may be able to work with other mixed animal veterinarians and get the word out to try to have them available for people. It's just something that's going to take some time. But hopefully we will have enough time to get this in place before next year. So what are we doing? I know it's all doom and gloom, but any change can be hard. But what we're trying to do is ease that action a little bit. Um, this past year, our board basically went through and developed a new policy statement, and a lot of that is based off of our current PQA principles that we're using antimicrobials judiciously. We are tracking their usage. We're not using them in places where they're not necessary. And so the board adopted that new statement. And secondly, they also allocated $1.4 million towards research and outreach efforts because, again, we have information in PQA, but that wasn't really specific to a lot of the things that are going to be changing in these two guidance documents by 2017. And so part of that is going to be about $750,000 for research. And what we're trying to do is look at a couple of different things. Are the antimicrobials that we're using effective? Um, a lot of times, a lot of these medications were made a long time ago, and some of their efficacy may or may not have been validated. So we're going to look at that. We're also going to look at are there other vaccination strategies that may offset some of the common herd health issues that can help reduce the need for antimicrobials. And then obviously we're going to look at other antimicrobial alternatives. Is there something in the feed? Are there different probiotics? Or are there other alternatives that might be able to take the place of antimicrobials or at least help maintain gut health and reduce the need for that. So those are the types of things that we're going to be identifying for research. We've also worked with USDA. Um, they've got a research program, and we went basically split funds with them and have also have an RFP or call for proposals out with them looking at this very issue. And so they can run a little bit higher dollar amounts of research that we can. And so collaborating with them also gives us access to some extra funds, so we're trying to really maximize what we have. 
And then lastly, we do have a full-time expert who looks at uh, antimicrobial resistance and food safety, Dr. Peter Davies. And so we've engaged him over this next year to really be an in-house subject matter expert to help us as we assess our risks for using antimicrobials, what can we do from a production standpoint and antimicrobial usage to reduce that risk. And so he will be helping us address our antibiotic stewardship and the impact a lot of our activities have. And so this is the stewardship plan, part of the, um, the board statement. And really there's three main components. There's education, research, and outreach. Our education is just as it says. We're working with, again, Dr. Davies and a lot of other people in the industry to develop materials that outline further what these guidance documents mean. They're defining and outlining resistance and why is that an issue and really trying to explain what's ongoing and how pork production and antimicrobial use fits in with a bigger global picture for medication use. And so we've got about 60,000 producers that we're working with to get this information developed for, but we're also working with a lot of our universities, a lot of our FFA groups, really to find out what are the needs for this type of information and then target our audiences for that. And so we know there's a lot of ways that we can reach producers, but we're really trying to, again, make this an industry-wide collaborative effort. I just mentioned the research. We do have a lot of other research that's been done in the past, but again, really we're looking forward and trying to come up with some of alternatives and different strategies for antimicrobial usage. And so we want to build on that about $5 million research we've done in the past and continue to really answer some of the main questions that exist with, with drug usage. And then lastly, there's communications effort. Obviously, again, we have about a year, a little less than a year's time, and so we want to make a very good and effective use of that time. So what information we've learned, we gain, questions we get, we want to make sure that we can send that out to the public so our producers are aware of what's going on. And so, for example, we have this antibiotic fact sheet. If you went onto the trade floor and went by the pork board booth, not to have shameless promotion, but if you went by there, we have this bulletin out there. And it really gives a nice four pages of what does these regulations mean for you. And this is really with what we know now. Obviously, things may change. We have a lot of questions. We know we may get better answers. But this is what we know today, and that fact sheet helps cover those things. And so ongoing expert, we've developed a blue ribbon panel. And so we have uh, Dr. Coleman, who is really going to be overseeing that from the pork board perspective. We've got different producers from our, our public health and workplace safety committee. We've got other working groups that we're, we're dealing with, such as our TQA working groups, our antibiotics and food and consumer working groups, again, to try to help identify where are the gaps in knowledge and resources that we need to help people understand how we use antimicrobials in pork production. And then lastly, we do have a panel, actually an independent panel of third-party people that will be addressing and assessing what are we doing as an industry. Um, do we, does what we're doing make sense? Are there things that we could be doing better? And so we're, we're convening this group of people that aren't necessarily tied to the pork industry. Um, and really, there's, there's an MDs on it. There's people within the food chain. There are, I think, is one veterinarian. But it's people that really don't, we don't deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. But we want to get their third-party perspective, a completely independent perspective, to help guide us in our activities. And so that'll, that's just getting kicked off as well. And so for any of our resources that I'll talk about in a minute, you can go to pork.org backslash antibiotics. And so that lists all of the research that we have and other resources. Now that is going to be subject to change. Again, as we gather more knowledge and data, as we get more questions answered, a lot of that will go out onto that website. But that gives you some resources to deal with. And so this is the part that I'll be doing for my counterpart in communication. So how are we getting the word out? Well, again, again, if you visit our, our uh, booth at the trade show, you'll see that we've got uh, the placard there with the timelines. But we wanted to have something splashy that we can put into magazines. It's in the most recent feedstuffs version. We've seen it in Hog Farmer. But really just to have people be aware, don't wait till 2017 to get a lot of these things done. It's going to be here way quicker than we know it. And so we just want people to make sure that they've got their relationships with their vets set up and have a lot of these things worked out well in advance. 
There's been a lot of media um, work that we've done, again, with, with Pork Network, Hog Farmer, Feedstuffs, Penton Publications. There's hundreds of thousands of different touches and circulations that we've done and or are planning on doing to make sure we get these messages out there. Also, digitally, we've worked with a lot of different magazines. Again, our communications department's doing this but really to make sure that people get kind of saturated with this information because it is such an integral part of what we do. We just want to make sure nobody gets caught unawares of what's happening. So additional producer awareness. Uh, we also, in addition, have a little trifold. I didn't bring it with me, but it's a little accordion pamphlet that also has an abbreviated version of what the guidelines are and what they mean. And that way you can keep them in the barn, keep them in your office or your desk, use that as a handy reference guide. And so we are also working on the responsible use of antimicrobials. That one's literally being completed as we speak. It's a more in-depth guide of resistance. It'll be going along with PQA as we start to train new trainers. That will be rolled into it. Um, and it's got a lot more specifics on antimicrobial resistance, what that means not only from a producer standpoint, but consumer as well. So that'll be a, a supplement for PQA. The other thing that we did is really look at the U.S. CARE principle. And so it's understand the new VFD and water rules. What do they mean? What do I need to do? Strengthen your vet client patient relationship. A lot of that you've already heard because if you're certified in PQA, you need to have that for your PQA certification. But if you don't, something to look into. Communicate with your feed mill. Are they prepared? Do they have the right documents and knowledge to be able to handle the VFD orders so you can make sure that your pigs are, have access to medication when they need it? Assess your herd health strategies. We talked about different vaccines. Are there things like a disease elimination or closing a herd for a period of time that might help reduce a bacterial load, which would hopefully reduce the need for antimicrobials. So that's a good time to work with your vet on your herd health situation. Renew commitment to antimicrobial use. Never hurts to go back and review principles. A lot of times we, you know, we do a lot of these things and they're in the back of our minds and it's just kind of like getting up out of bed, going to take a shower, get your coffee and go to work. You just do it. I think sometimes it's a good thing to step back and say, okay, why am I doing this again? Am I doing the right things? Just renew what we're doing. And then lastly, ensure to keep your records in compliance. I think this is going to be a lot more under scrutiny than we've ever had in the past because of this push on the regulations, not just from FDA, but on all other aspects of, of industry and even on the consumer front. And so having accurate records is going to be a really big, important piece of this puzzle. Um, and that will be reflected in a lot of our PQA changes as well. So message and delivery, you've seen, if any of you get our checkoff letters, you've seen a lot of this come out in a lot of different media sources. And again, all of this is available at pork.org backslash antibiotics. The other thing that we're focusing on is showing, because a lot of times, you know, we, we may not always think that, oh, hell, the show industry, a lot of our FFA and 4-H kids are our backbone for our current industry. And so we want to make sure that we reach out, work with those folks to say, hey, guys, are you aware of these things and how it's going to impact your show pigs and make sure that they're doing the right thing and what they need to legally be doing. And so we're working with um, NJSA, we're working with a lot of the 4-H uh, and FFA educators and extension folks to make sure that they're also getting this information out to their kids and to their uh, families. And so that's something that we're really making a broad effort to get done. And it had been really well received. So that also ties in with our PQA um, revisions as well as youth PQA. So all of this is all going to be married together and continue to be delivered so that all aspects of our industry are, are touched. So trade shows, again, you guys have seen this. We're just on the front end of our trade shows right now, but we're really trying to get uh, these out to all 30 states. So I've been to several, got a few more to go to. I know a lot of other staff will be at many more, but we're trying to get the word out to all of our state trade shows, port congresses, and winter meetings about this message. So don't think that you guys are the only ones that get this. We're, we're hitting everybody. 
So just some other things that we're doing, promotional items. We've got some cloth gloves. If you hadn't got some, we have those out there. We've got little calendars that basically you're doing the countdown for you. You can stick them on your car, stick them in your office, stick them wherever. But at least, again, trying to have things in the forefront of people's minds of, hey, be aware of this. Stuff's going to change. And so lastly, just to wrap it up, really our message is be ready. Things are going to change whether we like it or not, but we do have enough time to get things together to make sure that we're all in compliance with the new regulations. Look at implementation of the U.S. CARES, uh, as we had that on the little um, slide earlier. And then just stay informed on VFD. That is a little bit more complicated um, because there are some issues with how feed mills deliver. If you manufacture feed on farm, we don't have all the answers yet, and Dr. Odlin's going to come out, cover a lot of things in her practice. But there's going to be a lot of questions, and we hope we'll continue to get more answers. So stay tuned. We hope to have a lot of those questions answered, we hope, before the end of the year. And so I do put this last slide up. Um, Dr. Jennifer Coleman really is the one that's spearheading a lot of our antimicrobial efforts. We're all active in it at the pork board. But if you have specific questions about antimicrobial use and the guidelines, I've got her email up here because she's compiling a lot of these questions. And what she's doing is going to FDA to get answers, getting those back. And then what we're going to do is use a lot of that information to make some public uh, frequently asked questions. So we'll be gathering a lot of this information over time and then getting it back to you guys as we get it addressed.